This is 911. Do you have an emergency? Today on Rescue 911, a striking discovery. A woman rushes out into the rain and finds her husband struck down by lightning. He's lying in my front yard. Okay, is he conscious? No. Rescuers must revive him over the phone. If I don't tell her what to do, he's going to die, no question about it. Then, do 911. During their seven-year marriage, John and Lynn Endicott of Lakeside, California, had rarely been able to take a vacation. On September 5, 1991, when they returned from their first vacation in three years, they had no idea how much their life together was about to change. Honey, you hear the dogs barking? I'm going to take him for a walk. Okay, hurry up, because dinner's ready. We just returned from a camping trip. We really hadn't had a vacation or some time off together. It just put our relationship right back where it was when we first met. It was a very wonderful feeling for the two of us. See you in a second, honey. Come on. I was absolutely terrified because I knew that lightning was close and I knew he was out there. John! Johnny! John, are you okay? There was no response from him at all. Nothing. 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 When we continue. I tried to drag him to the garage, but he was too heavy. But somehow I just couldn't give up. He wouldn't give up on me and I would never give up on him. There. The call for help came into Heartland Communications dispatcher, Scott Cullen. Off of Sleepy Creek, he's lying in my front yard. Okay, is he conscious? No, he's not. Is he my breathing? Is he breathing? No. Please, what do I do now? Okay, they're on the way. They'll be right there, okay? No, help me. I gotta, what should I do? I could tell by the emotional level that it was something pretty serious right away. Can you bring the phone out where he is? Do you have a... Oh, yes, I can. Help me, God, help me. I kind of hesitated about starting to give CPR instructions because technically I haven't been told that I can do this. Are you out there? Oh, I'm not. God, he's just lying in the rain. Okay, are you near where he... Though Scott had just completed an emergency medical training course that day, okay. legally he was not yet allowed to give medical instructions. The are on the way out there now, okay? They'll be there in a short period of time. Okay, is he breathing? Okay, is there any way you can get him to near where the phone is? Yes, can I drag him? Can you drag him near where the phone is? All right. Okay, they're already on the way, okay? I'm just staying on the line with you. I knew that we had to get him near the phone, and it, it was totally up to her to do it. I grabbed him and tried to drag him to the garage, but he was too heavy. <laughs> the first thing thought of was I was going to spend the rest of my life alone without him and I couldn't do that. And I don't know, just got the strength somewhere down inside of me and got a hold of him and dragged him the however many feet it was to the garage. Okay, is he over, is he by where you're at? Ten feet away. Okay, I want you to, okay, I want you to shake his shoulders and yell at him, make sure he's unconscious, do it now. Okay. The initial objective before you want to start doing CPR on anybody is make sure they are not conscious, they do not have a pulse, and they are not breathing because you can hurt somebody if they don't need CPR. Face is very purple. Okay. There's a big lump over his eye. Okay, did he move or respond at all? No. Is he breathing? No. Okay, you're sure? Positive. Okay, the, the engine is going to be there in just a minute. No, I can't see him coming over the hill. They're not here. Tell me now. If you lose your job for doing the right thing, then you lose your job. You know, there's, there's a moral imperative here. If I don't tell her what to do, he's going to die, no question about it. I want you to go kneel on the, side of the, on the side of your husband next to his head. 
Okay, I want you to place the palm of your hand that's closest to his feet under his neck and use your other hand to put it back on his forehead and tilt his head back. Do it now. As soon as I was on my way back to him, I knew what the answer was already. I knew there was nothing there. He's still not breathing? No. Okay, listen to me. Calm down. We're going to get through this. I want you to pinch his nose shut with your fingers. Got it. Take a deep breath and cover his mouth with your mouth and make a tight seal. Okay? Blow into his mouth and watch to see if his chest rises. Do it now two times. It rises. It's making a glubbing noise. Okay. With your index and your middle fingers, touch the center of his neck by his Adam's apple. Slide your fingers toward the back of the neck into the groove and feel for his pulse. Yep. Do it now. There is no pulse. Okay, the paramedics are going to be there. I want you to... I was very nervous because there was no question that he was basically clinically dead. Okay, I want you to place your second hand on top, on top of the first top. and rapidly compress the chest two inches with your hands. I want you to rapidly do this 15 times in 15 Three, seconds. Four, okay. five, six, 15 times. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, now take a deep breath and pinch his nose and blow into his mouth like you did before. Be sure to make a tight seal. Do it now. He's just blurting it out. Okay, is he breathing? No. Okay, I want you to keep doing that till the paramedics get there. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, God, eight. You're Nine, doing fine. 10, I love him. 13, 14, 15, he okay. can't die. Okay, two breaths. The more I did the compressions, the more frustrated I got because there was no response from John at all, nothing. Don't die. Don't die. He, okay, he don't. don't let him die. Stay calm. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're helping him. With a full arrest, you start CPR. You don't stop until somebody comes in and takes over. You have to make them understand that they are helping doing what they're doing. 11, 12, 13. Tell them to come quicker. Okay, they're, they're on their way. They're right here. Okay. Within 12 minutes of the call, the Lakeside Fire Department arrived, including Scott Culkin, who was on his first call as a paramedic. Move aside, please. Move aside. My initial concern was the fact that there was still lightning striking in the area. So my first concern was to get the patient quickly loaded into the ambulance. The patient was in a rhythm called a systole, which is also known as a flat line on the monitor. Uh, the patient was clinically dead. I asked them at the time, were you able to start his heart on his own? And they said no. It didn't look very good. But somehow I just couldn't give up. He wouldn't give up on me, and I would never give up on him. Ever. Let's go ahead with epinephrine, Mike, and we'll give him some epinephrine. We gave the patient several rounds of medications, and we got no response. At that point, we felt that the patient probably would not survive. Uh, he remained in a flat line with no pulses and, and never, never was breathing on his own. It had been more than 30 minutes since John's heart stopped beating. We'll have a systole in the monitor. Okay, let's go to the bike car. Go ahead the bike car. Here you go. Four, five. Approximately two minutes from arriving at the emergency department, our base hospital physician gave an order to give the patient sodium bicarbonate, which was a deviation from our protocol. Five. Okay, Mike, bike car is on board. Five. We have a normal sinus rhythm on the monitor. Five. Check pulses, please. Check pulses. Apparently, the base hospital physician knew what lightning did to the heart, but uh, I don't think that any of us felt that he would survive this event, even though he did have a pulse when we delivered him. 35-year-old John Endicott was taken to the University of California San Diego Medical Center and put under the care of Dr. David Hoyt. John was in a deep coma. His CAT scan suggested that his injury was due to the fact that he had a cardiac arrest. His EEG also suggested that he was not likely to make any useful recovery. The doctor finally came out. Hi, I'm Dr. Edelstein. And they were worked on him for over an hour. I've tried everything, but I don't think he's And to the first thing he did was he gave me my husband's wedding ring. ring. And then they started to tell me that things were not very good. Somehow, I felt I was in 
give up. They were talking to someone else, but he was looking at me in the eyes saying, your husband's going to die. I would go in and talk to him or hold his hand. I always touched him. I was always talking to him, telling what was going on, that I missed him and loved him. I used to sing to him, Johnny Angel. Johnny Angel. But I never gave up hope. They were talking about if he lived, he had a 1% chance of becoming a functioning human being. That's like somebody that can get out of bed and that's about it has no thought process at all. After two weeks, amazingly, Lynn did see a change in her husband's condition. Just walked right over to him and leaned right down to him and gave him a kiss right on his lips. And he kissed me back. So I did it a second time, just to be sure that I wasn't imagining things. And he kissed me back a second time. That's when I knew. There was someone in there and he knew who I was. Five weeks after being struck by lightning, John was released from the hospital. But it took 20 months of speech, physical, and occupational therapy before he could return to work. I'm happy to be alive. I want to thank everyone who saved my life. Without their help, I wouldn't be here today. I hope someday I can repay them. He's got short-term memory problems right now. And sometimes his reactions are a little slower than they used to be. But physically, there's no scars or any other problems. He's just not quite as strong as he used to be, but through time, that will come back. It truly is a miracle that he is alive. The most amazing thing to me about John's recovery is the fact that uh, we were wrong. We had lost hope. His wife did not. She saw us through that extra week, and that made the difference. And I think there's no question that had uh, she lost hope at that point, that there may have been a different outcome. It's wonderful to have him back. <laughs> We'd like to go on someday, maybe even have a family. Uh, we just are glad to be back together. Scott Cohen, the 911 operator, didn't do just what he had to do. He made a judgment on his own to give me that CPR information. And my husband is alive because he made that decision. I could never tell him thank you enough. I've been a dispatcher for nine years, and this last year is the first year that they've let us give these pre-arrival instructions. A lot of people are under the impression that when they call 911, that the people on the other end are going to be able to tell them exactly what to do, CPR, mouth-to-mouth, -mouth, whatever. But the sad fact is that most fire departments do not allow dispatchers to tell them what to do. There's...